men in the photos are known only as the three tramps. They started snapping pictures right about, yeah, right about here. This is Chauncey Holt, a career criminal now living in California. Holt claims that he is this man, the tramp in the hat. His story is fantastic. This is the story of Chauncey Marvin Holt, a longtime contract agent for the Central Intelligence Agency and a mafia associate. You're about to see the interview conducted with Mr. Holt just eight days before he died. This is his story. incestuous relationship that that you know existed and probably exists at the moment between these various very powerful elements organized crime intelligence community the uh, the uh, uh, political uh, and uh, powerful business interests <laughs> I felt that the American public had a right to know the, as, as many of the details that I have available. I grew up in southern Kentucky where bootlegging was a way of life. I mean, it was probably the most important crop, just like marijuana is in certain counties now. and. Uh, it was nothing uh, unusual about bootlegging because uh, uh, when the uh, Scotch-Irish uh, immigrants came to Kentucky uh, in the early part of the 17th century, they bought, brought their stills with them. And, and whiskey making was a, one of their skills and they always did it. For the young Chauncey, there was no stigma attached to being a bootlegger. Not only, uh, you know, distilled the whiskey, what we delivered it, usually to uh, somewhere like Knoxville, Tennessee, which was close, about 40 miles, and we as far away as, as Cincinnati. Chauncey Holt got around, and getting around got him in trouble. He ended up in reform school in Chillicothe, Ohio. Now it's, they have prisons for youthful offenders. That was what it would have been in those days, but they called it a uh, reform school. And I'd uh, been in there for, I got, uh, <laughs> railroaded by the FBI for joy riding in a car. That was, that was Hoover's big thing in those days, was catching youth car thieves. Usually someone else caught them and they took the credit. And uh, although we were in the, right in the middle of the war, I mean, Hoover took the time to send wire after wire down to Louisville wanting to know why we hadn't been prosecuted. Gives you an idea how, what importance he placed on those type things. This teletype, April 23rd, 1942, from Hoover to FBI Louisville office says, in part, Chauncey Marvin Holt et al. Advised by return teletype status prosecution of this case. In the event final prosecution complete, submit report immediately reflecting results of prosecution. It's signed, Hoover. While I was there, I met uh, several people that were connected with organized crime. So he said, if you want to, if you want, I'll put you in touch with, uh, with these guys in, in Baltimore who, are, who work hand in glove with, with uh, Meyer Lansky. Uh, one was Cy Bloom and his brother Morris. Cy Bloom handled all the bookmaking operations for Lansky in the Baltimore area. And uh, so and then through, it was through that connection that he came down to, uh, Lansky came down to, uh, Baltimore to visit with uh, Cy Bloom and to see his son Buddy Lansky who at that time was uh, in the Phipps Clinic. He was disabled. He was in the Phipps Clinic and I, I knew him. I had 
gotten acquainted with him, with Buddy, and we used to go and play chess with him and that sort of thing, because I was doing some painting painting work for the uh, uh, <coughs> restoring a painting right across the street. Chauncey Holt's skills as a painter would serve him well. A Renaissance man, he developed other skills. He became an arms expert in the military, as well as learning how to fly an airplane. Holt also did another kind of flying, but not inside a cockpit. My uncle, by marriage, owned a small one-ring circus. And uh, from the time I was six years old, I mean, I was uh, running up and down the tight wire, you know, swinging on the trapeze. I worked in, uh, in so I worked in, the, in this family circus. And uh, I did a, a single trapeze act, I worked in a flying act, I did a low wire act, a high wire act, uh, shot from the cannon, uh, all that sort of thing, you know. The circus performer in Chauncey Holt thought getting shot out of a cannon was a hell of a lot safer and easier than getting shot at. Chauncey's Baltimore connection with Meyer Lansky would lead to a long relationship with the mobster and other important mob figures, including the head of the Detroit family, Peter Licavoli. I did a little work for him in, in painting. He sent, he sent some paintings over to me for, to be restored, and that started a relationship with Licavoli that lasted, uh, well, it lasted 50 years. It lasted from, uh, from uh, 44 until the date of his death in, in 1984. I had a lot of other, other qualities that they that they they liked. First of all, I was a pilot. Secondly, I was a, uh, a very good shooter. I was a, uh, a weapons expert. Uh, I uh, and and of course the art didn't help. It didn't hurt because it it extended to forgery if necessary. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, and of course I was a good very good accountant, very good money manager. And I, probably I did more money managing and more uh, fiscal type work down through the years than I did the other types of, uh, of work. Chauncey's math skills, he was brilliant with figures, caught Meyer Lansky's attention. So Lansky was coming down to Baltimore to see Buddy and he was going to you know, check up on the operation, uh, the bookmaking operation, and Cy Bloom called me. I was working in the shipyard. He called me and uh, asked me if I'd like to come over and meet Meyer Lansky. So, he had, he had told, he told Meyer Lansky that I, I was a mathematical genius. Well, I, I may have seemed like a mathematical genius to, to, uh, to him, but uh, anyway, so Lansky came in, he, he, we were talking, and it turned out that uh, he, was, he was like me in the sense that he used to work mathematical problems just like he'd work a crossword puzzle. He, he'd get a whole a book with nothing but problems in it, mostly algebraic problems. So he, uh, said, I want to work out this little problem for you, and you show, show me the fallacy in it, because you start out with, with a premise, and you end up, and, and it looks like two equals one. So we go down through, the, uh, uh, we go down through these equations, and uh, it started out with A equals B. Well, down in the middle of this uh, computation, you divide by A minus B. Well, A minus, if A equals B, A minus B is zero. So, uh, I pointed it out and I said, there, there's a fallacy. And he said, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's right. He says, uh, uh, anything divided by zero, the, the answer is zero. And uh, so I said, told him, that, well, technically he was, technically he was wrong for, for the simple reason that the answer is not uh, zero, it's infinity. And so he was very, very impressed. And he said, now if you ever come down to Florida, I had said, I've thought about coming to Florida after the war. He says, if you come down to Florida, he said, uh, be sure and look me up. You can uh, tutor me in analytical, uh, differential integral calculus subject he was interested in. So I knew that I'd made a very, very valuable uh, connection. 
Chauncey Holt got a close-up and a personal look at one of the most powerful members of organized crime. Lansky, although he had a very violent past, having been, you know, a member of the Bug, the uh, Bugs and uh, Meyer gang, and he could uh, be as ruthless as the next person, and he could, uh, in, you know, in uh, getting what he wanted. However, he was he was extremely intelligent. He was polite. He was uh, very low key. Uh, he was compassionate. Many things that you you don't find in the in, in the average gangster. He, he never actually thought of himself uh, as a gangster, although to do that you'd have to exclude his early, his early life, because he just considered himself simply a gambler who was providing the public with something that they begged for. Well, I knew him from uh, start starting in 44. I knew him until he went to Israel. As a matter of fact, I had a short letter from him just before he went to Israel saying he was he had decided to, uh, you know, go to Israel and live. Lansky writes to Marvin Holt in a letter dated May 25th, 1970. Dear Marvin, I have decided to go and live in Israel. I will be here at Ray's for a few days. Ray's is Ray Ryan's El Mirador Hotel in Palm Springs. The letter goes on to say, I would like to see you before I go. Fly down here if you can. I don't dare come to L.A. If I don't get to see you before we leave, I want to thank you for the past favors. Keep your nose clean. I will write you from Israel if I don't get to see you. Your friend, Meyer. Lansky wanted to migrate to Israel, but was having difficulties entering the country. Like the letter he wrote to Chauncey, Lansky's personal appeal to the Prime Minister of Israel is also handwritten. Lansky tells Menachem Begin he wants very much to live in Israel and blames his image problems on the media. Chauncey became acquainted with another notorious crime figure, the man many say created a gambling oasis in the Nevada desert, Bugsy Siegel. Soon after I, uh, after the war, I went south and hooked up with the, uh, uh, with, with Lansky, started working for his, uh, his organization. I worked for uh, his main accounting firm, and I also was office manager of one of his, uh, uh, his front organizations, which was used for uh, a lot for stock manipulations and that sort of thing. And uh, I also, uh, worked at the uh, at the Colonial Inn, which was the, the plushest of the uh, carpet joints there in Florida at that time. The Colonial Inn in Hollandale, Florida was a hot spot. Show business types, mobsters, and politicians flocked to the glamorous gambling nightclub resort. It was Lansky's prototype for Las Vegas gambling and casinos. All the while, Holt was privy to the Lansky Las Vegas Bugsy Siegel connection. Actually, I met him actually before they, they started the they started the flamingo. The first trip that I made west with him to, see, to meet Siegel, he was going out because Siegel wanted him to put in, uh, go into buying the El Cortez Hotel. On their first trip to Las Vegas, Lansky told Holt he wasn't worried about J. Edgar Hoover. The mob had compromising photos of the FBI director and his aide Clyde Tolson taken at the Del Charo Lodge in La Jolla, California. The mob was worried about Siegel's mishandling their money in Las Vegas. The Brotherhood, who had put up six million dollars, uh, they were beginning to be concerned about their money. So we went out to talk to uh, talk to Siegel again and to uh, uh, look into the rumors that he and Virginia Hill had been squirreling away money for their, for their retirement. So we went out and we talked to all the vendors and so forth. This principal one was the general contractor was Dell Webb and we talked to him and, and we discovered at once that Siegel, well, he was, he, he was, he hadn't paid Dell Webb nearly as much money as he said. So it was obvious that he was stealing. So we came back 
And shortly after that, they had a big meeting in Havana when all the uh, everybody, ever top Bob, Bob figure in the, in the, in the well, well, not only in, in the country, but Lucky Luciano came from Italy, came to Havana to uh, um, have this have a conference about what they were going to do about about Lansky. I mean, about uh, about Siegel. Aunt Lansky pleaded for him. You know, she said, hey, "Look, what well, you know? He served us long and well. Why don't we give him just a little piece of the action and and." And let let him get out, and uh, he came back. So he said, "Okay." So Lansky and I made another trip to uh, to California, and he told Lansky and I, right to our face, that you know, we could shove it, that the flamingo was his, and he was keeping it, and that was that. Because he had a, he had a violent, violent, uncontrollable temper, and so as far as that went, I mean, that was his that was his death warrant. That conversation was on 19th of June, 1947. A day later, Siegel was dead. On the 20th, we followed Siegel around all day to the barber shop, to his lawyer. Uh, he went over to a place on uh, Fountain Avenue to meet a girlfriend. You know, he didn't didn't seem like he had a wor didn't seem like he had a worry in the world. Siegel was murdered, three shots to the head. Chauncey denied any involvement in the actual murder of Siegel. He didn't pull the trigger, he swears. But he hints at his role at lookout performing surveillance for the mob hitmen. He never denies his relationship with another important crime figure. Peter Licavoli was one of the most important organized crime uh, figures in the country. He was probably the last of a, of a dying breed. He grew up in um, St. Louis, uh, a big Sicilian family. Uh, he was imported by the Purple Gang into Detroit in the, uh, the early 30s to uh, act as enforcers. Then uh, they finally took over and he became one of five ruling dons of Detroit. The, Detroit operated differently than, say, New York. New York had five separate families headed by five separate people. They had one family that was headed by five ruling dons, of which one was uh, Peter Licavoli. Yeah, he was into everything. I mean, he was into loan sharking, and he was into, into uh, anything that prostitution, anything that uh, that uh, that that the mob is normally, uh, uh, you know, in uh, involved in, and he had really he had a really a great love for art, and he was a uh, he was a sucker when it came to buying art, especially Italian art. He loved he loved buying Italian art, and uh, we used to buy that stuff by the roomful, you know, because he was trying to clean up his image. And he, he, he was a competent painter. I have some of his paintings. It was during the Kefarber Committee hearings into organized crime that Chauncey's career took a turn. Meyer Lansky had been ordered to testify. He was one of the few guys that didn't end up in jail because most of them in ended up in jail because of contempt of Congress. But he, he got up there and he answered all their questions. And uh, uh, he, well, he appeared first without a lawyer, then he had his lawyer. But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, he, he was quick on his feet. Chauncey is quick, too, immediately accepting an offer of a unique job offered him by Lansky. The year is 1953. I can put you in a job. You want to have a job. I could put you in over here at the uh, International uh, Rescue Committee as a uh, uh, controller at a real good job, at a real good salary. I thought it was a philanthropic organization like the Red Cross or something, like the name implies. They like those innocuous names of the, the CIA. So I, uh, I, w I was sitting there when a guy walked in from Washington, his name was uh, Richard Sluter came in and he explained to me the facts of life, that uh, this was a proprietary interest of the CIA. 
Chauncey's aliases were many. He would use 25 different names while working for the mob and the CIA. We had two types of aliases. We had floating aliases that uh, more than one agent used and uh, uh, a number of agents used over the years that you'd just slap a picture on. Now I used, I, I had, uh, I used uh, Charles Hormley, Robert Ralston, Marvin Hoyt, which is not too far from my own name. However, as far as deep cover agents uh, aliases went, I had three deep cover agents that would withstand the, the vigorous uh, scrutiny. One was the one that I used the longest time was John R. Moon. I used Kearney L. Sigler, and I used Dean Rutz. The CIA hadn't been in business too long, but already had a clear target, Guatemala. Chauncey assumed a new identity and began training for his mission at a secret CIA base in Arizona. So I became Robert Ralston, and I had these, these, uh, uh, all these credentials in that name. So I went out to Aranya, which was a big base, well it became an awful big base later, it wasn't much of a base in those years, it was right near Tucson that the CIA used. It was a training, uh, training facility and I went out to get some multi-engine training because in, in preparation for going down to, uh, to Guatemala. Chauncey's personal records include copies of CIA contract agent paperwork. This type of supporting documentation involving a CIA contract agent has never been made public before. I first went to Guatemala as a part of a uh, five-man uh, assassination team, I guess you'd call us, that went down to uh, uh, figure what we, what we were going to do. Uh, it looked like that uh, our Benz was going to win the, the next year's election, and we were trying to get a uh, a uh, CIA-approved candidate to uh, um, to run in, 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 uh, against him. But the plan was a failure, and our Benz remained in power. So here we were with this guy who was an out-and-out -out communist sitting there. At that time, Eisenhower, Dulles, and those guys all up and down the line said, you know, this guy's got to go. So we found another guy who had, was, was in prison down there, and his name is Casilio Armas, and he was educated in the United States. Uh, he had gone to the, uh, the Command and General Staff School at Leavenworth and so forth. He, he was uh, he, he's caught in a coup and they uh, he, uh, uh, sentenced him to death and he was in, he was in jail. So we went down and, uh, and got the guy out of jail, uh, which was very easy. All we did was just grease a few palms and he walked right out into a limousine, you know. It wasn't, wasn't a 007 type deal, you know. Armas, backed with a 300-man army and the CIA, invaded Guatemala from Nicaragua. I was flying a C-47 and we used, it, it, we had a C-47 because we would either, we could either push uh, ordnance out the door or, or we could actually use it for leaflets. And of course, we were, we were flying over Guatemala City just distributing those leaflets about to, for our bins to give up and so forth, and which he did. He threw in the sponge in August. He, he fled the country, and of course, uh, then uh, Eisenhower was able to uh, 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 say that Guatemala was now back in the hands of the people. Even while working for the CIA, Chauncey continued to work for organized crime. I always kept in touch. Uh, and if, uh, uh, you know, if Meyer Lansky or any of his group wanted something of me, they certainly would, uh, they didn't, didn't hesitate to ask me. When Castro landed uh, up in Escambray Mountains and started his little revolution, he got some he got some aid from Ca from uh, from Lansky, simply because Lansky was just sort of hedging his bet. As a matter of fact, 
he had an agreement with Castro that if he took over the government, he'd let him continue operating the casinos. After Castro actually came to power in 1959, uh, he let them operate for about two months, and then he confiscated the hotels, confiscated them. And so naturally, they were interested in getting back to, uh, back to Cuba. Lansky himself, personally, had a $1 million contract out on, uh, on, Ca on Castro. So here we had these, these people, and then we had uh, the CIA, and we had the mob all trying to get, get, rid of, uh, get rid of Castro. Cuba wasn't the only interest. So was the Dominican Republic and its dictator, Rafael Trujillo. The government was pushing very, very vigorously to, uh, to get rid of Castro, and they had uh, uh, enlisted the aid of uh, uh, Trujillo and Johnny Abbas, who was his uh, head of security, who was one of the uh, best assassins in the world. But they suddenly, somewhere in the, uh, about this time, the State Department decided, hey, well, we've had enough of uh, Trujillo. Trujillo has to go, so we're going to. So they started putting plans in the hopper to kill, to kill uh, Trujillo. So that removed one very, very uh, dangerous foe of, uh, uh, of Castro. A CIA letter dated March 17, 1961, sent to a CIA team, including Chauncey, says, in case you plan to hunt this territory, recommend high-powered foreign-made rifle with telescopic scope and silencer. Have already obtained necessary licenses and paid the fees. That means the Trujillo assassination had the go-ahead. He was murdered two weeks later. The mob had never forgotten how Castro had double-crossed them. So they set in motion a series of deadly plans to assassinate the Cuban leader. Lansky had uh, actually, uh, it was, he had actually offered a contract of a million dollars for anyone who would uh, dispose of Castro. Now, he had a viable, in my opinion, it was the most workable plan to assassinate uh, Castro that uh, they ever was ever conceived. And uh, they had uh, assassin chosen, they got the weapon in, it came in with some circus equipment. It was, uh, uh, they had rented a, an apartment which was within 300 yards of the, of the uh, television station where he used to walk back and forth and harangue for hour on end and so forth. And, uh, but at the last minute, uh, uh, it, it was cold, called off. And it was called off through pressure from the State Department. The CIA didn't want to give up. They wanted a location in South Florida to keep close tabs on Castro. They again turned to Meyer Lansky. Down in the Florida Keys at Marathon had built this uh, this airport strictly for his use, but the CIA began to use it, and we started making flights from Marathon. It wasn't too far Marath from Marathon into Cuba, and we would insert agents into Cuba. We would uh, deliver arms and ammunition into uh, into Cuba. Uh, we made um, you know literally dozens and dozens of flights. Uh, into uh, into Cuba uh, in uh, in 19 in 1960. Intrigue, ineptitude, and infighting, CIA and State Department doomed any efforts. Uh, everybody seemed to be working at cross purposes, and finally, uh, at the uh, uh, just before the 1960 election, uh, they they came up with this idea of invading Cuba. And uh, 
what started out to, from being a very uh, uh, small, over-the-beach Dieppe-type raid uh, turned into a, to a full, <laughs> full assault. That full assault, the Bay of Pigs invasion, would be a complete failure, a major embarrassment for the Kennedy administration and the impetus for Operation Mongoose. Operation Mongoose was a uh, ill-conceived um, operation, joint operation between organized crime and the CIA to, to actually simply kill Castro. And um, they had there's some various memos. As a matter of fact, I have a few memos how it how it ended up, how they were talking about what they were going to do, and so forth. Here are some of the memos Chauncey refers to. These men participated in a meeting held at a small airport between Palm Springs and Indio, California. The name? Bermuda Dunes. In that meeting, uh, Peter Licavoli and I flew in from, uh, from Arizona. Uh, Sam Giancana, Johnny Roselli uh, came in from Chicago. Uh, William King Harvey came from from Langley. William King Harvey was a legend in the CIA. He was the only member. He was the only CIA member there. But of course, he was the he was the one that was laying out the plan. Who was William King Harvey? Chauncey was well aware of his involvement in other CIA operations. William King Harvey was the head of. Uh, Task Force W. That had been renamed originally. That was a part of uh, ZR Rifle, uh, operation called ZR Rifle. ZR Rifle was nothing more than uh, that an assassination uh, group that went around the world assassinating people. And Harvey happened to be the head of ZR Rifle. On December 14, 1961, top echelon leaders of the CIA and the Mafia met at Bermuda Dunes Airport in Palm Springs to discuss ground rules for Operation Mongoose. Chauncey's memos from that meeting show an executive action was planned. Executive action means assassination. The target, the beard, Castro. The ground rules, CIA only, maximum security, non-attributability, plausible denial, need-to-know basis. Harvey set the tone of the meeting at the Bermuda Dunes airport. They were going to uh, eliminate the beard and uh, how it was going to be done and what just starting as to what personnel they were going to hire. Uh, first of all, they were trying to decide what uh, <coughs> uh, cryptonym they were going to use for this because they had decided that they would uh, assign it to cryptonym and it would end up in the official CIA files. Uh, AM, normally Q op uh, operations involving Cuba had an AM uh, start to their cryptonym. So we said, well, we don't, don't want to use don't want to use AM. What are we going to use? They started looking down the list, and an MO was some uh, cryptonym for some obscure place way out in the Pacific somewhere. So we said, "Hey, that would be a good to use MO." And somebody said, "Well, what's going to go with what goes with MO?" And so it flows, you know. So somebody said, "Hey, how about mongoose?" You know, the mongoose never loses, you know, that's, that's a good one, you know. Everybody, said, everybody agreed, just, hey, we'll call it Operation Mongoose. It's also decided any further discussions about Operation Mongoose would be face-to-face, -face, nothing in writing. The CIA's William King Harvey was clearly in charge. It was a very short meeting because of the fact that... Uh, 20 minutes an hour. Yeah, 20 minutes an hour. It didn't take very long. I mean, he laid it out in precise terms. Uh, these guys wanted to get out, you know, and, uh, and you know, take on off. And uh, 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 guys like Giancana and, and Roselli 
I mean, they're reluctant, you know, to get together. These high, and Ligavoli too, these high-ranking mobsters don't like to meet with each other, and rarely do they. So uh, we kept it short and sweet, and, uh, and, that, and that was it. An August 14, 1962, inter-office CIA memo from William King Harvey to the director of clandestine operations says, in part, our contract agents in Miami and Los Angeles have been assured by me that no reference to this operation appears in our central files. Our first order of business was to set up a documentation mill. So we started looking around for, for a plant, and we found one that was ideal, and it was in financial trouble. Uh, it was called the Los Angeles Stamp and Stationery Company. It was a very old uh, LA firm that owned a very valuable building uh, in, uh, uh, in downtown uh, Los Angeles, which was ideally set up, because what we could do, the, the first four floors of this building was devoted to uh, legitimate business. We went right on with their printing. They printed, they did, they did banners, they did badges, they did uh, uh, high, uh, high quality printing, such as stock certificates, bonds, that sort of thing. But more importantly in that for our, which for us was the fact that they made police badges for just about every uh, a police department in, in, in the United States. And then the, then the top floor was uh, devoted to our clandestine operation. So we had a, we had a group of, uh, of employees that knew nothing about what went on upstairs. But upstairs, we did all the disinformation stuff, all the, all the fake IDs, uh, and that sort of thing. The agency also wanted a machine shop to handle weapon modifications. We discovered this place at, uh, at, at Goleta, which is uh, California, which is at the Santa Barbara airport. So there again, it was located on, on the airport. So you, we could taxi, we could land there, taxi in, pull right in. We had a big hangar, just pull right into that facility, which is great, you know, for loading and un unloading arms and that sort of thing. And there again, this was an operating machine shop that uh, continued its own work, but when we came along, we said, hey, we want, uh, uh, we want 500 silencers. We got 500 silencers. By late 1962, both covert operations were up and running. Both were used by the mob and the CIA. Holt's immediate supervisor on behalf of the agency was Phil Twombly. Philip Twombly had been, at one time, the executive vice president for Caribbean operations of Coca-Cola, which, which used to boast that it was the eyes and ears of the CIA in the Caribbean. So we know that they had, he was well connected. Uh, we never actually knew how well until we got to the, until we start, came to the West Coast and we were told that all of our funds would be coming from Philip Twombly. And all of our orders would be coming from Philip Twombly, or, and a longtime agent by the name of Richard Wilson. The head of the CIA uh, in uh, Los Angeles was a guy by the name of Ernst Leibacher. And we were told that no, except in an extreme emergency, we were not to contact Leibacher that our operations were outside the normal loop of the, of the CIA. So suddenly, I mean, at first uh, we, we had no trouble setting up all these things, but then we started making, making requests for capital equipment that we felt that we needed, and um, it, it had just slowed to a trickle for some reason. I mean, we just weren't getting any funds. But suddenly, in early 1963, the purse strings loosened. We're not talking about uh, piddly little, little uh, procurements. We're talking about big ticket items. Among them was a, uh, 
we, we wanted a corporate jet to fly back and forth in a fast, fast uh, we wanted to get a, and the, the best one at that time was the Gulf Stream, which was a, uh, a turboprop job. The startling thing about it was they were telling us, hey, you, you're, we got money. At the end of 63, I mean, at the end of April in 63, I received a, a note from Philip Twombly, which, uh, uh, in which he said that we would soon be receiving a special order from our distributor in New Orleans. A letter from Twombly dated April 29th, 1963, is addressed to Jack Boone, Chauncey's favorite alias. I want you to personally supervise this project and make the delivery yourself to New Orleans. It's signed, Regards, Phil. Our distributor in New Orleans happened to be Guy Bannister, uh, who was a, is a well-known person known to all the uh, assassination researchers because he was a very mysterious guy and was, was probably uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's control. Twombly's letter to Chauncey Holt, a.k.a. Jack Moon, ended with this instruction. The customer wants all the original artwork destroyed when the job is completed. It bothered me from day one was the vilification of Lee Harvey Oswald, because I know that Lee Harvey o Oswald was a, uh, was a patsy. I know that he was executed just the same as everyone else. Chauncey is absolutely convinced that Oswald was framed. Although my re revelations probably won't add uh, uh, too much to What's, uh, what's already been said, but all I wanted to do was to, uh, uh, I felt that the, uh, the American people are entitled to know. The editing for the next portion of the Holt interview will be minimal. You will hear Chauncey Holt's words as he spoke them. He's talking about his New Orleans assignment. It's late spring, 1963. It turned out that this work was for Lee Harvey Oswald. We did uh, documentation, uh, identity documents in the name of Lee Harvey Oswald, Lee Henry Oswald, Leon Osborne, and Alex Heidel. Alex Heidel. We weren't sure at the, at the time who's, who were actually doing it who this person was for the simple reason that the same picture that appeared on Lee Harvey Oswald also ap appeared on Leon Osborne. So we didn't know whether this guy was actually Leon Osborne or, or that, or he might not, he might have been neither. So we didn't know exactly who this was. So we, we delivered some of this, some of this uh, uh, documentation was redoing some other documentation that someone else had done, and it was very amateurish, and uh, would never pass, wouldn't pass muster. If you looked at it very closely, you'd know it was a forgery. So it was mer merely cleaning it up. Some of it was new. Uh, one of the new, one of the new things that we did for for him was to show a, a card showing that uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was a member of the Communist Party. Well. That presented a little problem for us because I didn't even know what, a, what that card looked like. And we hunted and hunted and hunted trying to find, find what it looked like. And we were finally told by experts that, hey, those, guys, those communists don't carry, these, don't carry any cards. But they wanted it, so we just had to wing it and make them a nice looking uh, card that showed him a member of the Communist Party. So we completed that in the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in May, May or June. In August, uh, we made a trip to, uh, to New Orleans to uh, 
deliver some guns and so forth. I had a uh, note, we had a note from George Reynolds. George Reynolds uh, operated four proprietary interests at Morgan City, Louisiana. And uh, he relayed, he was a high level Apparently, he, he operated at a high level because a lot of instructions came from him and a lot of money came from him. A lot of money came from, from his organization direct, uh, direct to whomever, whomever I said send it to. So he worked at a high level. Besides, he was extremely well connected uh, to the intelligence community. His sister, was married to uh, Frank Belcher, who was one of the uh, uh, most powerful figures, legal figures, in in California. Now, Frank Belcher was also he was partners with Joe Ball, not actually not actually partners in their law firm. They had their separate law firms, but they operated together. Joe Ball, like Belcher, was an influential legal figure. He was president of the California State Bar and gained national exposure as a senior counsel to the Warren Commission. According to Chauncey, both Belcher and Ball were part of an interlocked web with far-reaching connections. Chauncey elaborates further about this shadowy network. George Reynolds had a brother whose name was Bob Reynolds. He was chief of station at J.M. Wave, very, and he was a high-level CIA uh, individual, employee. Besides, Frank Belcher was related to J.A. Belcher of J.A. Belcher Oil Company. They had old-time oil money from Texas. He also was known to be a CIA asset. It was well known, and so all these all these things were working we're working to, uh, together. So I get a letter from George Reynolds telling me that, that he and Leroy Young, who happened to be his second in command, he was a weapons expert, helicopter pilot, uh, you know, soldier of fortune type, and that they were going to be in uh, New Orleans uh, for about a 20-day 20, 20 day, 20 day period, and I was going to New Orleans to deliver some guns to Louis McWilly, who was a high-level uh, 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 high organized crime figure. All these people, of course, were connected to the CIA. CIA knew what was going on. So I was going to deliver these guns over there. So while I was there, and I had some stuff for Guy Bannister, uh, he sent me this note saying he was going to be there and that he was going to be at the LaSalle Hotel and to meet uh, a guy by the name of Thomas Eli Davis. Thomas Davis, he was another one of those soldier of fortune types that, that worked, for the, worked for the CIA. So while we, was, while we were over there, on the, the, on the ninth day of, of, uh, of, Aug of August in 63, I, I had never seen Oswald. So uh, I was down talking to to Guy Bannister, and he said, well, Oswald is, is over uh, on the next street uh, handing out leaflets, so why don't I go over and uh, and take a look at him? I don't have to introduce myself, but, you know, more, at least I'd see him. So I went over, and it turned out that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and a guy named Carlos Bringuer got into a shoving match there, and uh, they they both ended up getting uh, arrested, for, actually for nothing really. So, so I went back over and, I, and Guy Bannister says, "Well, you know, I guess we should get uh, go down and get Oswald, bail him out, and so forth." But before we could bail him out, uh, a uh, Oswald's uncle, Doug Dutch Moretz, worked for Carlos Marcello, so they sent a guy down to get him out of uh, um, the uh, out of jail. Oh, he's fine. And that was on a Friday. And on Monday, he was to 
appear in night court. I went down to night court to, to see what was going on, and they gave and talked to him. And I talked to him for a while, and uh, they uh, gave um, you know gave him a little fine, and then and he left. That was your first. Uh, that was the first time I saw Oswald in night court. Yeah, well, that's first. Well, I saw him, but the first time I introduced myself to him, you know, went up and said who I was and so forth, and and uh, and talked to him for a while, and uh, he was an interesting, interesting kid to talk to. You know, he had just turned 24. Well, he had. Well, he wasn't even 24 then. He was 23 then. He he didn't turn 24 until October. But uh, we had we had an interesting little talk, and then on uh, on Friday. Uh, he was back in front of the uh, the trademark handing out leaflets again. I happened to be in in the trademark talking to a guy by the name of Lloyd Cobb. Lloyd Cobb, they called him the Potato Man because he owned 8,000 acres of potatoes up around Jackson, uh, Louisiana. He was as far right wing as you can get. And he was very, very high up. Those guys at the trademark, uh, John Lawrence may have been the president of the trademark, and uh, Clay Shaw uh, may have been the director. But they all took their uh, took their uh, orders from Lloyd Cobb. So I went in, and just as I came out of the building, I look, and there's a television camera there. Uh, taking pictures of w D WSDU as they're taking pictures of of this this little uh, m handing out these pamphlets. Well, I I just ducked down the side, and I, I thought I, I thought I wasn't caught on film, but it turned that, that turned out that I was. A television news crew was outside the International Trade Mart and captured on film Oswald passing out fair play for Cuba protest leaflets. Transferred to stills, it clearly shows Oswald at work. From a different angle, you see bystanders reading the leaflets. In this still taken from the film, Oswald's head is turned away from the camera. And from another still, Chauncey, in sunglasses, is seen exiting the trademark building. He's on the far right. On Chauncey's left, Leroy Young, George Reynolds' assistant. Well, the, all this stuff really concerned Philip Twombly. Twombly resolved the problem of Chauncey being identified on that news film with the help of New Orleans FBI agent Warren DeBruze. The disinformation campaign worked, as Twombly wrote Chauncey. Dear Jack, the Potato Man advised our distributor in New Orleans that Warren has submitted a report and has positively identified the man coming out of the trademark as the public relations man, not Chauncey. Again, the distributor in New Orleans was Guy Bannister. Lloyd Cobb was able to uh, pull all these strings and get and had them misidentified by employees of the trademark who were that he was their boss, and uh, so we managed to we managed to uh, extricate ourselves from that possibility. I, I couldn't understand is why that they were so worried about it and why that they were doing so much with they was, had so much interest in Oswald. Oswald was an interesting kid, but you know to try to say that they were trying to separate us from the Fair Play for Cuba uh, Act and didn't want us involved and so forth, I indicated clearly to me, uh, you know, or didn't then, but later on, I got the idea as, hey, you know, this guy is, was important to them, and, I, and later on, I understood why, because they undoubtedly had, had other plans for him. And the fact that it was, that this, this inquiry was initiated by Philip Twombly indicated to me that Twombly was cognizant of, of these plans that were, that were in the work. About the same time of the New Orleans episode with Oswald, Chauncey received an unusual order from the Texas gun dealer. In the summer of 1963, 
we received a uh, an order, I guess you'd call it an order, or a request from a, 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 um, a gunsmith in Dallas by the name of John T. Mason, spelled with an E, and asking us to buy all the existing uh, models of the Manlicher Carcano uh, rifle. The Manlicher Carcano was an Italian-made military rifle, probably the poorest made military rifle that was ever designed. They called it the Manlicher. Uh, the name of Manlicher shouldn't even been on it. Manlicher was a great Austrian gunmaker, but the only thing that he had anything to do with in, with the Manlicher Carcano was that he he designed the magazine. But they said, buy these existing, uh, uh, buy these guns. They and do it. They had us doing a lot of uh, chronograph uh, work on them, uh, measuring uh, uh, muzzle velocity and that sort of thing, using all kinds of loads, underloading, overloading, and so forth. And um, we um, so we that's a normal sort of thing with. We we bought we bought these we bought these these rifles from Sam Cummins, who was another we had another CIA front over on uh, at Western Surplus out on Arroyo Seca in in Pasadena. We bought these things for three dollars a piece. This would give you an idea how how what, what kind of a gun these were. So <laughs> you'd be better off with a bow and arrow. Uh, so. Then they sent us a bunch of uh, the man. The, the, the one particular man, uh, Carcano shot a 6.5 uh, millimeter uh, used bullet, and um, we received a bunch of 6.5 Manlicher Carcano bullets. At first glance, if you you look at them at first glance. You think that they are they're on fire that their new, new bullets just cast, but if you examine them very carefully, you could see that they had been fired at least once, and they had been fired into either water or a wadding or something, so they did get uh, 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 just just formed, you know, uh, formed out of shape, distorted, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, then they asked us to load a number of these into a, a 264 Remington case. 264 and 6.5 are the same. They, but, however, the the um, uh, the Remington. I mean, you can you can use that from a quality sniper's rifle, such as a such as a. Uh, Remington 700, uh, one of those. I mean, instead of sticking with that, sticking with that cheap char Carcano. So it's obviously these these people who do this have have something in mind. So we loaded uh, we loaded a lot of those cases. We also loaded cases for them what they call Mexican loads. Mexican loads are you take in this case, we took a, a 308 case and we necked it down. So that it would take the 6.5, and then we put the 6.5 in it, and of course this would be, be could be fired from a from the uh, a 308, and a lot, there's a lot of good good 308s around. As a matter of fact, the M14, which was the top flight military rifle at that time, used the 308. However, the only drawback in that, of course, is as the the fact of firing that small projectile out of a lot, you you don't know where the hell it's going. I mean, you certainly you certainly know uh, you're going to deliver it somewhere, but you can't be sure of hitting anything. So it's apparent that that Mason uh, at Mason's they've got they've got something going something going there. So we produced all that stuff and delivered it to him in the in the summer of, uh, of 1963. 
On April 23, 1963, the first news release came out concerning President Kennedy's trip to Dallas. What happened at that time, they were, Kennedy himself was, he, on the one hand, he was talking about uh, uh, having a big speech before the 2506 uh, Brigade saying this is going to be delivered, this flag is going to be delivered to a free Cuba, we'll never let up and blah, 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 all that political rhetoric, when in fact his emissary, William Atwood, was at that time negotiating with Raul Castro to ease up on some of the restrictions and, and build up a, a, a improve the relationship with the United States. Well, I mean, this is not what the CIA uh, they, wants to hear. So what they decided to do was that we're going to create this disturbance, and uh, uh, which was probably attempt on the life of the president, or a seemingly attempt on his life, that would be laid to the door of the pro-Castro Cubans. That way, it would inject a little life back into their program. So that was what they, that was what we we were told. So as part of our what we our role in it was going to be was that we were going to um, forge a lot of identification, secret service identification. Not only the cards that they carry but the lapel pins that they wear. The, only, the problem in this, of course, is the fact that, the, that they change that lapel uh, every two or three days. Of course, the only person who would actually know would be another Secret Service agent. I mean, I'd look at it, I wouldn't know, you wouldn't know, but they thought it was important enough to, hey, to have the real, the real thing. So we, we were waiting we were waiting on this before we could could make our delivery to uh, to Dallas. Chauncey was to deliver the fake Secret Service identification to Dallas, but even before Dallas, the president had been scheduled to speak in Miami. However, the Secret Service got wind of an assassination plot against the president in that Florida city. We prepared some stuff for the Miami thing, which was supposed to was supposed to take place on November the 9th. This incident. Yeah, this incident. And we provided the same type of identification as we, were, as we did for Dallas. The only problem is that uh, they intercepted some, a telephone conversation that indicated that there was going to be an attempt on Kennedy's life and they didn't have the motorcade. They took him directly to where he was going to speak by helicopter and re returned him by helicopter, and they had to cancel that operation. So we were, we were waiting for the, for, this, for the second one, which was going to be in Dallas, because it seemed that that was going to be uh, a viable project. Uh, and uh, we were waiting for the word from Twombly what the color of the uh, identification badges were going to be for that particular day. That was the only thing remaining to, that we had to put together and to be, uh, be delivered and, and how many we, we were going to produce. Chauncey and his Confederates knew that JFK was going to be in Texas. Early on we knew that he was going to be in San Antonio, Houston, uh, Fort Worth, uh, and Dallas. However, the exact date, we didn't learn the exact date until uh, probably uh, uh, maybe the uh, oh, as late as the 15th or 16th. I'm really not sure exactly when we learned because it, it, it is, uh, his agenda hadn't, hadn't been exactly set. Chauncey was waiting to hear when and how many sets of fake Secret Service IDs were needed in Dallas. Then the orders arrived. It came from, from Philip Twombly. Uh, he did not tell, tell us precisely how we were to get it there except that it was to be delivered, hopefully it was to be delivered on the, the night of the 
21st. Twombly's memo is dated November 12th, 1963, to Jack, Los Angeles Stamp and Stationery Company, says in part, number needed undetermined at this time, but will not be in excess of 15. Twombly's referring to the sets of fake Secret Service IDs. He says, schedule accordingly. The color of the, uh, the, the uh, Secret Service uh, acting ones, the ones that are uh, charged with the uh, protection of the president, they were these lapel pins, easily recognizable. They look like a little, kind of like a good conduct medal. But, uh, and they change them from time to time because they figure if they, if they're, if they, you, have the same color too long, somebody's going to make a handful of them. So they keep changing them, changing them. So uh, we didn't find out until uh, about the 16th that uh, they, the color it was going to be, which turned out to be the same uh, colors as, the, as they have on the, te the, the uh, flag of Texas. Those were the pins Chauncey was ordered to deliver to Dallas. Our intention first was to fly uh, directly from Los Angeles uh, to, to Dallas, which is no problem. Then on November the 12th, I received a uh, letter from, from Peter Ligavoli in which he, he uh, told me to be sure and stop by the ranch that uh, Charlie Masseri and, and, and Charlie uh, Nicoletti and Leo Masseri wanted to go to Dallas and um, uh, on their way to New Orleans. He indicated that he had picked up for us a large station wagon, which was uh, registered in the name of John O'Malley and all the documents indicated John O'Malley. I had a driver's license and identification of the name of John O'Malley, which is the name I decided that I was going to use on this particular trip. Chauncey picked up the Mafia hitman at Grace Ranch, owned by Licavoli. The ranch also provided safe haven for contract agents of the CIA. So we arrived there expecting that we would all four fly to, uh, to Dallas. However, when we got there, we discovered that Nicoletti and Mosseri had a hell of a lot of luggage, and it, and it was heavy luggage, and uh, weighed a lot. So we we thought that it was going to be too risky flying it, uh, doing it that way. So we had this station wagon. We said, "Oh, what the hell? I mean, we we'll, we'll drive from Tucson, drive from Tucson to Dallas." So we all we all took off. Uh, we encountered first at Lordsburg, New Mexico, we had uh, car, car trouble, which held us up for a few hours while they were trying to get the part. Uh, then uh, just, just uh, west of um, El Paso, we hit a storm that was so, a windstorm was so bad that we had to stop. You couldn't drive. Took the paint right off the car. A check of the El Paso Times weather report for November 21st. Quote, a frontal system passed through the city about 7.30 a.m. with winds recorded from 29 to 35 miles per hour. It was a coup d'etat and I do not believe that that is the way, not in, in this country, you know, for a change of command. JFK and Jackie Kennedy arrive in Dallas by plane. It's November 22nd. Early the same morning, Chauncey also reaches Dallas. He drops off the mob hitmen and checks into the Adolphus Hotel. I received a note from, uh, from Twombly telling me that he was going to be, that week, he was going to be at the bottling convention uh, in uh, Dallas. 
uh, he told me that he had made a reservation for Joe Caddy and I at the Adolphus Hotel where we could stay and rest up a little bit if we wanted to be before we, before we uh, came back to the coast. He also indicated that he was going to be staying at a private home, which I uh, uh, believe uh, was probably with Clint Murchison because he was a, he was a uh, uh, very close friend of Clint Murchison. And that also that he would be, that uh, he would be meeting Kendall there. Kendall, of course, was a Pepsi-Cola was another one that uh, uh, bragged about being the uh, eyes and ears of the CIA. Twombly's note to Chauncey tells him to stay as long as you like at the Adolphus. Twombly also reserves a room for Joe Canty, a fellow pilot and CIA contract agent. Everything is taken care of. Just sign the tab. Twombly continues, Kendall and I are staying with friends. Twombly's instructions to Chauncey were simple. We were supposed to meet a, an individual by the name of Homer Rechefaria. Homer Rechefaria had a, um, he was violently uh, anti-Castro, I mean anti-Kennedy. No one hated Kennedy any more than, than Homer Rechefaria. According to records from the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the Secret Service received a tip that on November 21, 1963, Homer S. Echevarria was overheard bragging his group had plenty of money and that his backers would proceed with the arms deal as soon as we take care of Kennedy. At that time, he and a guy by the name Paulino Sierra, they were running around putting together what they said was a expeditionary force that was going to uh, to invade Cuba. Uh, the Cubans, of course, that was just the name, was just the thing that he actually wanted to, uh, they wanted to hear. So we were to put it in a station wagon owned by Homer Echeverria. They were to, uh, uh, they gave us the uh, uh, tag number and so forth the of the, of the pickup truck and we were, and keys, we had a set of keys, master keys, and uh, uh, all we, had, we were just going to put the uh, false identification. There was nothing else, no guns, anything else. Would put it in in there and lock it, lock it up, and that that would be it. A picture taken years later in a parking lot behind the notorious Grassy Knoll shows Chauncey pointing to the area where his station wagon was parked. They had a parking area that was used by uh, law enforcement personnel that was locked, which we had a key to. And we were able to go in there, and we went around. We looked for the pickup truck, and we didn't see it. So we uh, relocked the gate, and uh, Canty and I decided that we would go out to the go out to Redbird Airport. At Redbird Airport was a plane just purchased using CIA covert funds. That was the plane that was sitting there waiting for us to take it back to California. Or actually we were going to take it back to uh, Bermuda Dunes where Ernie Dunleavy there at, at the Bermuda Dunes uh, aircraft company was going to do a uh, top overhaul on it to make sure that it was, was in good condition. So, so we went out and I dropped off I dropped off uh, Caddy there, and uh, it's interesting that uh, Dwayne January, who at that time was the manager of that airport, he still remembers that plane very well. And the reason he remembers the plane very well is the fact that the uh, the painting was on it. It had, if it had been owned by a gear company, and it had a beautiful beautiful rendering of a huge gear that took up the entire tail on this aircraft. And he remembers it, and he also remembers it because of the fact that uh, Canty spent so long running the engine up, running the engine up, that, that he had a complaint from the residents around there that he was making too much, too much noise. So, uh, but that was, that was his job to do that. So then I went back, and as, when I came back to Dealey Plaza this time, uh, the pickup truck was there. It was now about 10.30 in the morning. I took the, the, uh, the satchel uh, holding all the, the IDs 
and I uh, put them in the uh, pickup truck, locked it, walked away. Uh, about 11 o'clock, a person who I never had never met, Homer S. Urea, but he had been introduced to me. I mean, he had, he had, I'd seen pictures of him, uh, and uh, it looked like, it appeared that's who it was. Came, got in the pickup truck, and drove off. A few minutes later, Chauncey noticed some suspicious activity in the parking lot behind the grassy knoll. Now, while I was there, there were several other cars that were, uh, uh, in, that were in the in and out and the parking lot that had people in them that at least one of whom I, I knew very well. Uh, one of the persons who drove in sat at the entrance for a long time and then left was an individual by the name of, of uh, uh, Aldo Vera Serafin, who was one of the foremost assassins uh, in the world. Chauncey observed him talking on the radio back and forth. Yep, and it looked like he's clicking the mic and so forth and talking on it and so forth. And then after a while, he, uh, uh, he left and drove out of the parking area. According to Chauncey, Seraphin was a freelancer, an assassin for hire. He was freelance. He worked for anybody, anybody who would. Chauncey was ordered to stay in the area of the plaza. Twombly told him some sort of staged pro-Castro demonstration would take place. Sort of in a, in a support position, almost like an observer, I guess. So I strolled up by the, uh, almost up to the corner of Houston and Elm Street. I was on the south side. I never actually got up there. And I looked over there and I saw quite a few Latin types. I saw individuals that it, uh, I had seen in the past. One of them, of course, was Luis Posada, who was another, uh, another assassin. Uh, Freddy Lugo, who was also another world-class assassin. And of course, I thought I saw Orlando, Orlando Bosch. Uh, the FBI said, later on, said, uh, couldn't have been Bosch. Bosch wasn't there because we had him under such tight surveillance. But I certainly wouldn't believe the FBI. So he was up there. Other individuals that looked, uh, uh, I thought that I saw Rip Robertson. He was another, had been a, a uh, he was a CIA uh, contract agent. And I, but I hadn't seen him since uh, 54. So, uh, you know, you might have, it, it might have looked like him. Another individual I thought I saw uh, was a guy named Tony Poe, to, stood for Tony Posfany. But uh, there again, uh, uh, it, he really wasn't, because later on, uh, he told me, I saw him later on, and he hadn't been out of Southeast Asia. But it was somebody looked like him and wore that same, they had the, the floppy, uh, fatigue type stuff that they wore, the military type hat and so forth. So he was another, he was another mysterious looking guy that was over there. So they were over there and you know, they're wandering around uh, Dealey Plaza for some, uh, some purpose. And uh, they had a, you know, an unusual number of, I mean, it'd be hard to find at a, at, at the Soldier of Fortune meet, it would be uh, hard, hard to find as many military types I was wandering around uh, in, in Dealey Plaza. And of course, he really weren't wondered about that. But after all, we were getting ready to have a demonstration, so, uh, so I thought. So anyway, I didn't, uh, uh, it didn't bother me too much. And of course, you're, 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 you know, you're tempted to go over and talk to these guys, and, but then again, you're operating on a need-to-know basis, and so you, you leave these guys alone. You don't do, do anything about it. Chauncey would learn later there were some other notorious individuals in Dealey Plaza. I've always thought that it was some effort to, you know, muddy the water. We got as many bad guys running around as you can possibly get, and they all seem to, 
gravitate, it just seems to me more than coincidental, that they would all show up in Dallas at the same time. And I think that if they had, uh, uh, if the Sheriff's Department, the FBI, or the uh, Dallas Police Department, if they had done their job, that jail down there would have been full of nefarious characters with all kinds of reputation. Chauncey was worried. His instincts told him something was up. But his orders from Twombly were clear. I had these BATF credentials, and uh, they were saying, if there is any, if you have any, if you have any trouble, uh, you go and jump in this boxcar. They identified the boxcar. You get in this boxcar, which will appear to be locked. It'll have a seal on it and everything else, and sweat out what what happens if the, if you if they're they have some kind of a serious confrontation. The boxcar was in a train yard behind the grassy knoll. It was the ninth car in a line of boxcars. But there was another order given Chauncey, an order for weapons. Uh, usually, uh, almost all of the requests for armament of any kind, either just stock uh, uh, rifles, pistols, to uh, silenced rifles, silenced pistols. Almost all of it came from uh, George Reynolds in Morgan City. Reynolds told Chauncey to make a delivery. I had had instructions that I was to deliver uh, uh, some guns and s some IDs to two other individuals, one of whom was uh, Charles Harrelson, and another was an individual that I knew uh, as Richard Montoya. Charles Roger, I mean Charles Harrelson, I had never met. I, he had been pointed out to me one time in John Mason's gun store by a guy I was with, and he said, That's, that, that is Charles Harrelson, uh, that he is, uh, he's a part owner in this gun store. Now, I had later on, uh, I did some ID, false ID work for Charles Harrelson, except he was using the alias of Terry Southern at that, at that time. So I'd seen his picture, you know, so uh, I mean, enough that you're pretty, after seeing him the one time and having his picture, I mean, you're, you're a pretty good idea that, hey, this is the guy. So he walked up to me and uh, he said, uh, are you John O'Malley? And I said, uh, yeah. And he said, I'm, I'm Charles Harrelson. I said, no, you're Charles Harper, because that was the name of the, uh, the uh, identification, was the name of Charles Har Harper. And uh, so I gave him the ID, and then they had requested that I bring over a couple of guns for, the, for, the, for him and the other guy, who I'll get to in a minute. And so I gave him this uh, uh, Smith & Wesson uh, Model 40, and uh, uh, I gave that to him. And the other guy was a guy named Richard Montoya. I had met him some time before. I met him at the home of Orlando Piedra. Orlando Piedra was a, had been formerly was the chief of police of, uh, of Havana. He was at that time living in, in his plush estate on Pine Tree Drive in Miami, and uh, uh, was, he was actually Batista's paymaster. So I'd met him, I went over, we went over to see, see Piedra about something, and this guy was introduced to me as, as uh, Richard Montoya. And uh, he spoke uh, a very good Spanish. Uh, I assumed that he was probably uh, an, uh, an American-born uh, uh, person that spoke Spanish, because he didn't look, uh, you know, he didn't look like a Cuban, that he was probably one of, uh, of uh, Piedra's uh, bodyguards, because he had a lot of them. So uh, uh, that was the second guy. So I gave him his ID, uh, and uh, then I uh, uh, 
and gave him the gun. I uh, gave him the, uh, and uh, so they took this and they walked away. Crowds had begun to gather along the route in anticipation of seeing the President of the United States and the First Lady. It was noon. Chauncey was pacing in the parking lot behind the grassy knoll, waiting for the staged demonstration to begin. I was told specifically by Philip H. Twombly that they were going to have this, he described it very specifically, that it was going to be a nonviolent demonstration incident that would be laid to the door of the pro-Castro Cubans. I just assume that included in there, if it's going to be something that's, that's uh, serious enough to inject some life into this thing, it has to be more than a, and a few uh, placards that is going to be uh, uh, more than those We Hate Kennedy uh, uh, placards that they were going to have to do something, and I would assume that, hey, they're going to take a shot at that motorcade and uh, with, with the intention of not hitting anyone. Maybe that's why they were going to use the Manning or Car Carnival, because they couldn't, couldn't be possible. They wouldn't know where, you, where they were going to shoot. On the surface, the plan seemed simple. The demonstration would lead to public outrage. Uh, you know that there's going to be a swell of public opinion is, hey, Put, turn the screws on Castro. They'd have been yelling for them to invade, invade Cuba and everything else. The presidential motorcade was moving closer and closer. Chauncey could hear the crowd growing excited. It was 1230. When the shooting started at 1230, then, immediately after the first shot, which was a weak type shot, I realized that this was not any, any simple demonstration. You know, in addition to, to all the shots, people were screaming and carrying on and running in all these directions. I didn't actually see the, see the shooting, although I was behind the picket fence within 25 yards of the motorcade, but I didn't see it. Stand by. Just a moment, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. Put me on, Phil. Put me on. Something has happened here. We understand there has been a shooting. The presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You can see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man spread eagle over the top of the car. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. Chauncey didn't see the president shot but he sure heard something. Oh, I heard it very well, and enough to know, first of all, that there was more shots fired than the three they claimed, and it seemed to me like uh, that, uh, you know, and being a, uh, you know, somewhat of, a, of, an, of an expert, uh, you know, on shooting, um, that the shots did not all come from the same direction. I am quite sure that the shots were from different caliber guns and from a different source, and I know that there's four shots and possibly five shots. It's very hard to distinguish uh, shots that are fired with, a, with an automatic or semi-auto uh, from you can shoot them as fast as the sounds merge together. But I, I believe that there's probably five shots and that they came from uh, different sources. It was just a fuselage of shots in a very, very short period of time. My first uh, think was to, hey, just get out of here, you know, just go over, mix with the crowd, you know, and go. But 
I'd been in, uh, I had been given specific instructions, and when, you, when you're given specific instructions, that's, that's what you do. We ha I had enough time to uh, just barely get to, get to the boxcar, and when I arrived there, these two other individuals, known to me as Harrelson and, and Montoya, were already there. Indicated that they were close by, and um, we jumped in the jumped in the box car, closed the door, and uh, just settled down to uh, wait everything out. There was a search party that came by many times, but this uh, this box car appeared to be locked. It had a seal on it, and they kept passing it up. We could hear them outside. We could hear their their. Uh, uh, the radios and so forth. The three sat in the boxcar for over an hour, listening to a police radio receiver Chauncey had concealed in a brown paper bag. Then around 2.20 p.m., the boxcar started to move. It moved up the tracks and then it backed down the tracks and stopped. What actually happened was that the uh, 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 Lee Bowers who happened to be the tower operator, which, which supervised all the, the movements in the yard, happened to see uh, somebody jump on, a, jump on the train further up. And he ordered the train stopped and they backed down, they backed down the tracks a little ways. We, didn't, we weren't too concerned about it at that time because of the fact that after all it was a switching yard. But suddenly they stopped and uh, for some reason, they chose that, that time they didn't pass the boxcar up. So we heard them uh, uh, rattling at the door, and uh, I immediately got out my uh, uh, BATF uh, credentials uh, because I certainly didn't want to have a, uh, a bunch of trigger ha ha happy cops dragging us out of there. So the minute they opened the door, of course, I flashed my credentials and said I was with the ATF, had a badge and that sort of thing, all the credentials. And D.V. Harkness was a sergeant for the, uh, uh, with the uh, Dallas Police Department. He was in charge of this detail. And another officer by the name of Roy Vaughn was almost like his second in command. Uh, so we identified ourselves, or I identified myself, I did all the talking. I identified and said, hey, we're, we're with the BATF. We're, we're working undercover, we're investigating this, uh, this uh, armed shipment and it's in this boxcar. And uh, he and Vaughn conferred for a little bit and uh, they decided that they would send me over to, uh, send us over to the, uh, the little uh, uh, area that had been set up as investigative type office. Like a command center or something? Yeah, a little, com little command center. They had the, had the sheriff's department, they had the police department, they had the FBI, it was all there. And it was over at the sheriff's, the sheriff's department. So uh, he assigned two cops, Marvin Wise and uh, Billy Bass, to escort us over. And we started over, and it was just like a leisurely walk. Uh, wasn't didn't seem like it was anything urgent. Uh, Harrelson was in the front at that time, and he was just sort of strolling along like, like uh, he was enjoying the whole situation. Uh, he was probably smoked up on something because he was a notorious narcotics user. So uh, then he suddenly changed to uh, Montoya, went by him, and Montoya got in front. So they took us around the plaza by the Texas Book Depository. They were headed to the sheriff's command post near Elm and Houston. Once there, the three were interrogated briefly and released. These men would later be called the Three Tramps. They were taking pictures of everybody in sight, and uh, incidentally, there's a lot of guys with pictures that they ended up taking their pictures that who still aren't sure who they were. I mean, one guy, they, one guy, they picked him up. Uh, they took a picture of this one guy. I mean, he's dressed all in black, almost like a ninja. Uh, and uh, uh, they, 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 still, they still don't know who that guy was. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a picture of one guy uh, that the, uh, po the police are putting in a police car. Uh, and uh, he's a 
military type looking guy, you know, very fit, had that crew haircut on, they're putting him in there, and they've been trying to identify this guy for all these years, and they, and they haven't been able to, he just, he just got lost in the shuffle like everybody else did. While a number of suspects were questioned within minutes of the shooting, that wasn't the case for Chauncey Montoya and Harrelson. They were detained two hours later. Just look at the shadows in the photos. It's clearly late afternoon. The pictures were taken uh, by reporters, uh, from the newspaper reporters, as we were walking around. They took pictures of us all the way around that, that plaza. You see a lot, and there's a lot of them walking in front of the uh, school book depository. Chauncey Holt's claim to be one of the so-called three tramps has been documented elsewhere. There is more than just Holt's word. There is also his face. It's just too Lois Gibson is the Houston Police Department's forensic artist. She made comparisons of Holt and the tramp in the photographs. This is just conclusive to me that that's the same man. She also compared pictures of Charles Harrelson with the tramp photo. Again, a perfect match. I'll stake my reputation on it for sure. Looking at the feet of the tramp, you will notice he has a distinctive walk, toes pointed outward. The same characteristics possessed by Chauncey. Chauncey developed his unmistakable gait as a result of his earlier years on the circus high wire. Off camera, Chauncey hints at the use of disguises in covert operations. Phil Twombly told Chauncey to dress the part of a working man. I was instructed to just blend in with the other individuals that were there uh, and uh, uh, the workers that were in the yards. So Chauncey in his working man's clothes, along with his boxcar companions, were led to the Dallas County Sheriff's Command Post in the Criminal Courts Building. The deputy sheriff that was in charge of sort of a preliminary type uh, investigation was a guy by the name of uh, David Elkins. So they took us up there and, and uh, had a few words with him, and uh, he called over to the police uh, department, and Will Fritz, who was the chief homicide detective and was really in charge of the whole thing, uh, came over and told Elkins, turn him over to Gordon Shanklin of the FBI. Chauncey was briefly interrogated by Gordon Shanklin of the FBI. Chauncey's fake credentials from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms came in real handy. So he looked at him, he was sort of convinced. He asked us a few questions, which uh, uh, didn't seem like he was too much interested. He uh, wanted to know how long we'd been in the boxcar. We said two hours. He wanted to know, did you hear the shots? No, we didn't hear the shots. What were you doing? Why did you have the door closed? Yeah, because we didn't want anybody from the outside knowing what we were doing. Were you aware of what was going on? No. Uh, what were you doing all this time? Oh, we were looking at the paperwork and we were inventorying the, the, the uh, arms and ammunition. Shanklin asked if Chauncey and his two associates were armed. They were. The two guns I had was very, were very unusual. One gun was a, uh, a shorty 45. It was a 45 that was just simply cut down. They had taken all natural, national match parts, they cut down the slide, they cut down the grip, they cut down everything about it. Otherwise, it was just like any other 45, except it had a hell of a kick. And uh, that was one, which is, and of course, it was hard, hard chromed, and uh, uh, it was very, very unusual gun. I would think probably $2,500, $3,000 worth of gunsmithing in it. The other gun that I had was a, technically, it was a, uh, a Simmerling uh, L22. Uh, it was re usually referred to as the Lickman because he was the guy who designed it. It was a very small 45 that was as, as, was as small as the 25 because you can see in the pictures it, it's laying beside the, the, uh, the 25 and it's no bigger. But it wasn't a semi-automatic. What you had to do, you'd fire a shot and then you'd, you'd rack it, fire again, rack it like that. But it was a uh, and of course, it, it was accurate up to about 25 yards and had one hell of a kick. 
Well, they, these were these were rare guns, and they they were very interested in the guns. And they he asked me if I could, if I'd mind if uh, if they uh, photographed the guns, and I said no. So they photographed the guns. They they gave them uh, gave them back to us. And uh, it was only years later, through an ex FBI agent, that I uh, managed to. Uh, uh, to get a hold of the pictures, he got the pictures for me, although he couldn't find the negatives in the files. But he did, he did send me the, uh, uh, you know, contact print. Shanklin bought Chauncey's story and told the three men they were free to go. Once Oswald was arrested, I mean, the FBI took no more interest in finding anybody because uh, within 15 minutes. J. Edgar Hoover had already declared that the president had been shot by a, a uh, communist carrying terrorist. And once Oswald was captured, that was the end of the game. Chauncey noticed someone he knew at the command post. It was a mafia courier. As I was walking out, uh, uh, actually, as we were walking, as we were walking in, uh, uh, Gene Braden, who was a organized crime figure, happened to be walking out. And I knew him, he had been detained temporarily. I knew him because, and I'd seen him uh, just the past week, I knew him because we shared offices uh, in, in a building at the corner of San Vicente and Wiltshire in uh, in Beverly Hills. So um, uh, I had seen him the week before and he indicated that he was going to be in uh, Dallas, going to be staying at the Cabana. He said, hey, why don't you come by and, and have a drink? So I knew he was there, but <clears throat> I didn't give any in indication of, uh, of knowing him. He didn't give any indication of knowing me, which of course I suppose was uh, it would have been disastrous if we hadn't, because here I am, he knows me as Moon. I'm using an alias of John O'Malley uh, in, in this particular operation. He had changed his name from Gene Brading to Jim, Jim Braden, and he had been arrested under that name, Jim Braden. And uh, suppose I'd run in and say, hi, Gene. You know, he said, hey, hello, Jack. I can see that there would have been a uh, they had uh, scooped us up in a hurry. Jim Braden, an ex-con on parole, was in the building across from the school book depository, the Daltex building. He was there, he says, to make a phone call. Braden was also taken into custody and released. Outside the command post, Chauncey headed toward the nearest telephone. There was a lot of sleazy bars and so forth along in there, so I walked down there and uh, went in to use the telephone. I didn't want to go over in the Daltex building or any of those buildings. I, I wanted to get as far away from Dealey Plaza as I could get. But on the other hand, I wanted to find out what, um, what they had told, uh, what they had talked about you know, with Jim Braden. I knew he was at the cabana, so I called over and I uh, spoke to him. Braden said the police questioned him and let him go. Chauncey asked Braden if he wanted to fly back to California with him. Braden declined. But he offered Chauncey a ride to Redbird Airport. Chauncey accepted. Braden would later leave Dallas by way of Love Field. Everybody scattered to the wind. Chauncey and fellow pilot Joe Canty took off to the Grace Ranch in Tucson, where they refueled before returning to California. Joe Canty, who was uh, was the the pilot that had gone with me, uh, we didn't we really didn't talk too much because, you know, you were just uh, you you were just reflecting on everything that happened, and it was almost all the way into Tucson. I mean, it was he 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 attended to the, to the to the flying, and I handled the radio, and but you know I was just a, actually alone with my thoughts. I really wasn't interested in talking at all. The 
the community seemed to be a group of individuals that liked to live on the edge. Uh, when you, when you are in that business and you use your power, you are going to provoke someone else equally as powerful. Somebody put it together very masterfully. After the assassination, Chauncey kept a low profile. In December, he got a letter from Peter Licavoli. The mob boss wrote Chauncey, quote, to wish him a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Hope 1964 is better than 1963. The letter made Chauncey uneasy because Licavoli knew Chauncey was in Dallas when JFK was murdered. Chauncey wondered what else Licavoli knew about the events of November 22nd. Chauncey had a good reason to be jittery. My uh, father-in-law called me up from Beverly Hills and said there was two very mysterious gentlemen looking for me. And they had the uh, information on my car, which is a new Cadillac with Arizona plates, which wouldn't be hard to spot. They had the N number on my airplane that I owned personally. And, of course, the first thing I thought about was, uh, was Dallas. I didn't know whether it was, I didn't know whether it was the cops or I didn't whether it was somebody just going to cut the umbilical cord. Chauncey contacted his ally, attorney Frank Belcher. Belcher advised him to see his associate, Joseph Ball. So I went down, and uh, uh, Joe Ball happened to be in Washington because they had formed the Warren Commission, and he was appointed as a senior counsel to the Warren Commission. So he wasn't there, but his uh, one of the senior partners, Hunt, talked to me. And I told him my story. I told him I was there. I had nothing to do with the assassination and so forth. And uh, he didn't. He just took a sort of an insouciant attitude. He didn't seem to be concerned. Said, uh, don't worry about it. He said uh, that, uh, that Joe had been appointed to the Warren Commission, and it had been formed for the sole purpose of proving beyond doubt that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin. And anything aside from that was going to be pushed under the rug, you can believe me. Chauncey realized the fix was in. Already a game plan for the Warren Commission, and this was, uh, this was in December of, uh, of 63. In January 1964, Chauncey received a letter of assurance from Frank Belcher. The letter reads, I spoke to Joe Ball today and went over the gist of your conversations with Mr. Hunt. Joe assures me there will be no legal problems resulting from the activities in Dallas. If uh, Belcher said something, I mean, he made, he made a promise, you, you know the ball will carry through. Joseph Ball was busy with his duties as senior counsel for the Warren Commission. His duties involved one certain aspect of the investigation, which fortunately included Dealey Plaza and what happened inside the, uh, the book depository. That's where, his, that's where his expertise came in, although he did do some questioning uh, regarding uh, the, uh, uh, the shooting of Officer Tibbet but he's mainly confined with, 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 uh, with that portion of it. He was designed to show that, hey, Oswald was up there. He, he did the shooting by, all by himself. Joseph Ball also managed another sensitive area of the investigation. The testimony of eyewitnesses and the police who said they had encountered Secret Service agents in Dealey Plaza. Mr. Sorrells testified and uh, his testimony was supported by other agents as well, that there were no Secret Service agents on the ground. According to the special agent in charge of operations in Dallas, there were no agents on foot in Dealey Plaza. All Secret Service personnel were assigned to the president's motorcade. The uh, other individuals, several other individuals, indicated that they saw and were stopped at various times by uh, people uh, who were carrying Secret Service uh, identification. And this in, was in the, in the behind the picket fence 
and it also happened in the rear of, uh, the, of the book depository. From all of this, my only conclusion can be that someone had forged Secret Service uh, uh, identification uh, and that they were using. Either we did it as our studio, or someone else did it. I would probably uh, would be willing to make book that it was the uh, Secret Service ones that we had produced uh, a few days before. Gene Hill was the closest eyewitness to Kennedy's murder, just feet from his limousine, across the street from the grassy knoll. She says she saw someone shoot the president from the knoll, and like many others, she ran to chase the man. Then she was stopped by a man who had Secret Service credentials. He had shown me some ID, Secret Service, he Did said. Did you say Secret Service? Yes, sir. A more disturbing aspect of the Warren Commission's work became apparent to Chauncey years later. In 1970, Joseph Ball had hinted to Chauncey that tampering with the evidence had occurred. The Dillard photo was one prime example. The photo shows the window just below the sixth floor window where Oswald was alleged to have fired from. This picture was taken by the Dallas Morning News photographer following the president's motorcade. It was taken about 15 seconds after the last shots were fired. Ball suggested to Chauncey, without elaborating, that the Dillard photograph had been altered. They weren't about to uh, entertain any other theory at all. It, it, if, if it was a credible witness that gave them testimony uh, that didn't agree with their preconceived ideas, they just didn't hear him. Chauncey had mixed feelings when he learned that some persons, or person, were intent on not revealing what really happened on November 22nd. I thought that our, uh, uh, our role was so peripheral that undoubtedly you could, you, could put a, you could put a pretty good spin on it, you know what I mean? And uh, so it was a great relief, although we still, we still didn't feel that we're actually in the clear because I, I, in the back of my mind are these two guys who were looking for me. Chauncey decided to leave the country while the Warren Commission deliberated. On January 12th, Frank Belcher wrote Chauncey. He recommended Chauncey take advantage of a safe house in Mexico that Belcher and Joseph Ball owned. They owned a lot and lot of, uh, of uh, properties together, including a safe house uh, in Acapulco, next door to Las Prisas, that uh, uh, was used by contract agents of the CIA, card-carrying agents, CIA, high-level uh, organized crime figures such as uh, Ligavoli, John Roselli, Giancana, Doc Stasher, uh, all those guys. So they were, you know, they were really, they were really joined. The Belcher letter to Chauncey continued, quote, let me know when you want to use the Acapulco house. As far as I know, the house is empty. Call Jorge and let him know when you would be arriving. The letter is signed, best regards, Frank Belcher. So Chauncey and two other CIA contract agents flew to Acapulco. Beautiful house. And uh, so while we were there, I got a letter from, from Ernie Dunleavy, uh, who was uh, Ray Ryan's uh, partner, and handled all the operations that dealt with aircraft. I got a letter from Ernie Dunleavy that said there's a couple of guys there looking for me. He tells Chauncey they said they were friends of yours, but I have my doubts. So I could see that they were, for some reason, somebody was, was really interested. So I decided that I called up um, Philip Twombly and told him, you know, I'd like to make myself scarce. He said, well, call up these, uh, uh, your colleagues at the uh, proprietary interests that you have and uh, see if they can handle things. So I called up Tony Materna at the Los Angeles Stamp and Stationery Company. He assured me that he, could, he wouldn't have any trouble carrying on. I called uh, uh, Dewey Martin, who ran the uh, uh, our, our uh, modification plant uh, in, uh, in Goleta. Uh, and uh, he said, no, production would continue. 
he 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 get his orders directly from from George Reynolds, and uh, Ernie Dunlavis said, you know, I could handle everything down here. So I kept I called everybody that I knew at uh, had worked with J M Wave. I called uh, Larry Downs, Tom Franklin, Philip Custer. Uh, all these were high level. Uh, uh, CIA uh, uh, individuals there. J.M. Wave was the huge CIA facility in South Florida that organized and supplied the CIA's secret war against Cuba. Then I started uh, uh, shopping around to get to get a new front, something to something or get a new assignment. 